the Joe Rogan experience. Things are getting very wild. Yeah, there is a lot of misinformation. You know, some people said, I invented 3i Atlas, this object, uh, in order to distract attention from the Epstein files. Is that what and, people are saying? <laughs> yeah, and I said, look, this object is the size of Manhattan <laughs> Island. It's at uh, four and a half times the Earth-Sun separation. Um, if I was able to put it out there, you know, uh, I would be more powerful than the Pope. <laughs> and because we're talking about a giant object that you can see from... Any place on Earth, you know, you can buy online uh, uh, a telescope that uh, will allow you, half a meter in size that will allow you to see it. It's out there. It cannot be faked. Well, those people are fools. You can't listen to those people. I don't listen to those. I, I don't listen to many people, you know. Uh, initially, a lot of people were dismissing your concerns, and they were saying that this object is nothing but a comet, and it's very normal. Uh, but then as it got closer and as we got more data, it seems like you're correct. Well, This I is have, a very unusual object. There is something really important to recognize here that usually when you deal with scientific matters, they have very little impact on the future of humanity. Very little. You know, if the neutrino has a little bit of a mass, it doesn't really matter. You know, when we discovered the Higgs boson, the biggest impact was to confirm some idea we had back in the 60s. And, uh, you know, obviously that affected, uh, you know, the, those people who got the Nobel Prize. But most of us continued uh, as if nothing happened. However, here, if we ever encounter alien technology, everything will change. It will affect the financial markets. It will affect politics in a major way. So my point is simple. This is different than other scientific matters. And the intelligence agencies know very well that events with very small probability have to be considered seriously because they, have, they could have major implications. Just think about October 7th. The Israeli intelligence agencies had a theory that the Hamas will do nothing. And... They got data that indicated something is going on out there, but they dismissed it because of their theory. Now, because as a result of their mistake, which was clearly a blunder, a lot of people died on both sides for that this could have been avoided if they were to consider a black swan event, an event that you put a small probability for it happening, but you look at anomalies in the data and say, look, the implications are so huge, we have to consider it. And, you know, this idea was already considered by the philosopher-mathematician Blaise Pascal. He talked about God, and he said, look, of course, you might think that God doesn't exist, the probability for that is small, but... The implications, if God exists, the implications are so huge that we have to discuss it. That was the argument, Pascal's wager. And the intelligence agencies know that. Believe me, the Israeli intelligence agencies will not make that mistake again. Now, here comes an object from outside the solar system, and it shows anomalies. The scientists would say we should be as careful as possible at talking about anything other than a rock. Now, they say that when they know that we launched, humanity launched a lot of space junk, you know, a lot of technological objects to space. And we also know that there are 100 billion stars like the sun in the Milky Way galaxy alone. Most of them formed billions of years before the sun. And there are billions of Earth-Sun analogs. Now, we all believe that we came out of a soup of chemicals. You know, that's the scientific narrative of how human intelligence came on this earth. And so it's quite likely that, you know, we are not the first one. Sorry to break the news. Uh, Elon Musk was probably not the most accomplished space entrepreneur since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And therefore, we should consider the possibility that things like us existed long before us. And you can ask the question, how long does it take our own technology, the Voyager spacecraft that we launched out of the solar system, how long does it take it to move to the opposite side of the Milky Way galaxy? You know, thousands of light years away, it takes less than a billion years. And that means that all these civilizations that had their history initiated billions of years before ours could have done it. And all we need to do as responsible scientists, is to check if among all the rocks that come 
from outside of our backyard are really rocks? Or maybe one of these objects might be a tennis ball that was thrown by a neighbor. And the reason I say that is, you know, we live at our home at our, at the, uh, on Earth uh, next to the sun. We look around us in the cosmic street and we see a lot of houses just like ours. There are billions of them probably. Now, my colleagues, those scientists who think traditionally, they say, well, you know, microbes came to Earth very early, therefore they must be everywhere. So let's define our highest priority, searching for microbes on other houses in our cosmic street. And I say, good, you can do that from the vantage point of your home. You can look through the window and search for microbes in your neighbor's yards. But you would need to put $10 billion dollars to develop a big enough instrument that would be able to detect the chemical fingerprints of microbes, you know, on exoplanets. Uh, and think about the possibility that there was actually there is a resident in one of those houses. You know, that resident might show up in your front door. At some mm. point, or you might see um, an object that arrives to your backyard or your mailbox from that per, uh, a resident. A black swan event. A black swan event. Or you might see some construction project in, uh, from a distance. That might be easier to detect than microbes. So we should hedge our bets. You know, we should uh, invest billions of dollars on both fronts. At the moment, the scientific community is willing to allocate money. More than 10 billion dollars to searching for microbes, but no recommendation is made to allocate any federal funding to the search for intelligence. And I say that that is an oversight. Let's, let's go back to I don't want one more time. A mua mua mua. OK, yeah. I don't want to screw it up. Um, th- how large was that? That was, was the size of a football field. Okay, uh, so of all their 100 meters. Small in comparison to 3i Atlas. Oh, yeah. My, that's my point, that 3i Atlas is a million times more massive, at least a million times more massive than Oumuamua. Right. And I immediately, as it was discovered, you know, it was July 1st, and my wife asked me to go on vacation to Aruba two days later. And uh, as I was going on the plane, and as I arrived there, I realized, wait, that doesn't make sense, because we should have seen millions of uh, Oumuamuas before we saw this one. You know, it's so big. And I also realized there is not enough rocky material per unit volume in interstellar space to deliver such a giant rock into the inner solar system within a period of a decade. You would expect it at the very optimistic scenario where you package all the material into objects that are five kilometers in diameter. You would imagine once per 10,000 years. So I wrote immediately a scientific paper. My wife was not happy that, you know, on our vacation, I was sitting on my computer, <laughs> but I just couldn't resist it. Right. And by the way, this paper I submitted for publication, uh, that was July 3rd or something. Um, and uh, then the editor said, oh, the paper is fine, but you have a concluding sentence at the end where you say, well, unless the object is smaller than estimated, Maybe it was targeting the inner source. That was my solution to say, you know, one way out of this dilemma of why is it so big is if it was targeting the inner solar system by design. And indeed, the trajectory is aligned with the plane of the planets around the sun to within five degrees. The chance for that at random is one in 500. Okay. And it's moving in a retrograde trajectory opposite to the motion of the planets, which is ideal for it to release mini probes that will get into the planets. It gets close to Mars, it gets close to Jupiter, it goes on the opposite side of the sun uh, relative to Earth when it's closest to the sun. And that's the time when a spacecraft could do a maneuver to take advantage of the sun's gravitational assist. You know, all of these are interesting indications that may be imply that some intelligence designed the trajectory. So I had one sentence at the end of the paper saying, maybe the trajectory was designed. And the editor said, no, no, no. The paper will not get published unless you remove that sentence. Wow. So now when you, are, when you listen to comet experts that say, well, this claim or that claim was never published in a peer-reviewed journal, guess what? They are the editors or the reviewers who are blocking the discussion on possibilities. 
And I think it's inappropriate, especially in the case of alien technology, because it could be a black swan event. It could be something that affects the future of humanity. And we, if we behave, you know, uh, very conservatively, we might not last very long. Well, it's also arrogant. It's, uh, it's arrogant. Yeah. The, this object is, ha, it shows that there's no iron. Oh, no. It, so, yeah. So then the composition yes. of the plume of gas so around this is, it. So this is before you knew about the composition. That's right. That you wrote this paper. Exactly. Okay. And so, so as time is going on, you are being shown to be correct. Well, we Or found more, more anomalies. More anomalies. More anomalies. So this is so not for, a normal thing. Not a normal thing. So for one thing, uh, there was a glow that looks like an extended feature. And everyone said, oh, that's a tail. That's the right. signature of a comet. Right. And I said, wait a minute. It, it's pointing towards the sun. It's not pointing away from the sun. Usually cometary tails are made of dust and gas, which is pushed back away from the sun by the radiation and the solar wind, you know. Um, and so this one was pointed towards the sun, not away from the sun. And the question is, why? And uh, actually, I calculated that, you know, it appeared very clearly in the sharpest image we had from the Hubble Space Telescope, which showed an elongation by a factor of two towards the sun. But we were looking at it like a cigar. We were looking almost along the cigar long axis uh, within 10 degrees of the object sun axis. So we were looking almost edge on. Mm -hmm. And I calculate if you were to correct for that, this would be a feature that is 10 times longer than it is wide, uh, you know, and, and that means it's like a jet. So the object was, had a jet in front of it towards the sun. The question is why? And, you know, the comet experts ignored it and just said, well, you know, comets are strange. You know, the, who knows? Um, but my point is, this is a blind date of in interstellar proportions. And my advice on blind dates is not to speak or say what you think this is, but to l observe the other side. You know, the best way to respond to a blind date is to observe the other side. Don't speak. Just observe the other side. Because it may be different than what you think. And maybe, you know, on one of the dates, you will have a serial killer. <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, um, explain, if you could, how we know the composition of this right. thing. So we can figure out composition of a plume of gas uh, by um, taking a spectrum of it, which means um, you basically have some kind of a prism that breaks, uh, you know, that uh, a, a light with different wavelengths is bent at different angles. And so you spread the light into the different colors. And if you do that, you, you can find the uh, fingerprints, the spectral fingerprints of specific atoms or molecules, because each atom or molecule has transitions. I, I actually teach, I taught it just uh, two days ago Uh, in a class that I teach uh, that is mandatory, obligatory at the Harvard Astronomy Department, where I was chair for a decade, you know, like between 2011, 2020. So this is the mandatory class. And I, I just taught how, you know, spectral lines emitted by atoms and molecules just two days ago. So this is a very well known thing. And we know the, the wavelengths of those and, and we use them to identify the composition. Uh, you know, we know which atoms produced these spectral lines, the fingerprints. It's just like fingerprints, okay? And, and so what was found, you know, and that's by multiple teams, there are three papers on that. We found nickel, a lot of nickel, but not, very little iron. At first, no iron whatsoever. Now, usually in all the comets in the past, from the solar system and also from interstellar space, there is one comet, Borisov, that was found. It's the second interstellar object, which looked just like a familiar comet. I had nothing to say about that one. It looked like a comet, behaved like a comet. It was a comet. But it had similar abundances of nickel and iron. The only place where we found before much more nickel than iron is in alloys that we produce industrially. For example, uh, for aerospace applications. Right. Uh, nickel alloys have a lot of nickel, no iron. So uh, maybe the skin of this object is, is industrially produced. That's, that was my suggestion. But what the authors of these papers said is, maybe nature is capable of going through the same chemical pathway 
of producing nickel without iron as we do in our industries. So they made the conjecture that this carbonyl pathway, which is well known in the industry world, uh, carbonyl is the pathway, the name of the pathway. They said, well, maybe this carbonyl pathway happens in nature. Uh, we have never seen it before, but that is their explanation. 